So now let's hone in on how the text for the same meter count relates. This is Matthew up at the top. The text that ends at 63, as I said before, is Amen Lego Humin, which means believe it when I tell you. And when you look just at Matthew, you see that the next text that he's introducing is saying, not one stone will be left upon another. The backdrop was the Matete, the students, going to him, Autu, his students, and they were pointing out Epidexi to him, Autoi. Tasoi Kodomas, the buildings of the temple. Now, they're doing that. He's not, he, that's all it's saying is what they did. Not saying what they said. In Matthew's, not saying what they said. Okay? Just that they were pointing it out. And when you're pointing something out, you're pointing it out to praise it or condemn it, but here to praise it. And we know that because of his reply. You know, don't you see all this? In other words, he's, he's, con he's uh, rebuking them. Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left on another. Which means that when they're pointing out the buildings, they're saying, oh, see how gorgeous the idea that it's going to be there forever. And they think that they're praising God. And they think that they're praising Him despite everything He'd been saying to them all that week. Because he's, that was, you know, this was the time after, you know, because this is Matthew 24. This is after the famous Matthew 16, where he, he tells them that he's going to the cross. Okay? And they didn't hear. They didn't understand. They weren't paying attention. And so from Matthew 16 forward in the narrative, just in the text you can see this, he starts warning everybody that he's going to die that the sheep are going to be scattered and at this point he's talking about what's going to happen to the temple to Yeru to Hieru okay and they're pointing out the temple to him like they hadn't heard what he'd been saying so now he gets real blunt you see all this don't you see all this and at the word see prophetically that's marking when Vespasian who was hired to take down the temple when he dies and Titus his son literal son was going to take the throne of Rome and then he's going to die three years later and that's real important because Christ was scheduled to die seven years later seven years from when he's going to die he's going to die two weeks from when he talks here he was supposed to die 56 years see 56 down here in Revelation he was supposed to die when he was age 40 and that was even in the Talmud he was scheduled to die when he was 40. That was mapped out in Isaiah 53. You'll have to see my Isaiah 53 playlist in Vimeo to see that. Because I go through each syllable and show you how, how you can know what I just told you. Because that's where I first discovered the meter. was in Isaiah 53. Okay, Christ was scheduled to die when he was 40. That you get from looking at the Bible dates that the Bible provides. Not dear Dr. So-and-so. Because the scholars can't add up the Bible dates right. They often get them right, but they more often get them wrong. And it's where they get them wrong that get you all screwed up about what the dates in Bible are. But if you just use the Bible, then you can get it right. He was supposed to die at age 40. And that was already in the Talmud. Sanhedrin, uh, tract 897 through 99. They all knew that. David ruled for 40 years, and then he retired. He didn't die. So Christ was supposed to rule for 40 years, but he was born a king, so he was supposed to die at age 40. But he's going to die early, which is why the 63 is important. Okay? That's extra seven years that have been made up by the time down here in Revelation John is talking. He's writing in what should have been the last seven years of history before the millennium would start. But it ain't going to start on time. That's the whole point of the book. Okay? So now, Christ's words were, Believe it when I tell you. That takes you to the 63. Alright? Saying, Hi, I'm talking to you now. 63 years before the millennium is supposed to start. Had there been no church. 
But of course there's going to be a church. That's what he's warning them about here. How time is going to go. Alright. And then of course you got Luke. This is the second one. And now what does Luke do? Luke takes the next phrase. So you can tell he's mapping to the syllable counts. Because he's using 63 here. But now he's making sure that the way he words it maps to the next phrase. It's not exactly the same words. He's, it's called indirect quotation in literature. This is the actual quotation Christ makes. There will not be one stone left upon another. Okay? But in order to get the 63 to match here in Matthew, Luke had to reword some stuff, like he uses teorete instead of blepete. See, here's blepete. That means to look at, to see, to observe. Teorete means to view as a spectator. That's where we get the word theater from in English. Okay? So he changes the wording, but it's got the same meaning. But he changes the wording so he can get these syllable counts to be what he wants. Alright? So that he has matched the next line, the next line in Matthew, the next line in Matthew after Amen Lego Humin is not one stone will be left on another. And so he slightly words it differently so that he can get the same syllable count and yet it's the next line. So he's tracking Matthew's text that tells you Matthew was first. Okay? And he's doing it deliberately because now he's making a point about 63 years from when he writes also. See, this is how you know this is from God. It's so precise. It's so fitted together. It talks backwards to time and it talks forwards to time. And who but God could do that? This is how you know that the the scripture is inspired. Without the meter, you really are just sort of hoping. Okay, God does witness it to you while you read it. But this is how you can like, oh, this has to be from God. There's no other way to do that. How can you tie so perfectly forward 63 years from 28 years after Christ died and match what he says next in the sentence which also is going to tie to what's going to be the Quito's world, which is precisely because no stone was going to be left on another. See, only God knows the future. Okay, my question is, did when Luke was writing this, and, well, of course, Matthew's using Christ's words, and so is Luke, but he's rewording it a little. Did they know exactly what history in the future was going to be? Because both of them are referencing this. One is referencing, this is referencing it at the beginning, the cause of it, and then the way it's going to end up is with Aeolia Capitolina topping the, the Holy of Holies. Okay, that's how it's going to end, because the Quito's War was one phase, that was the first start of it in 114 AD, but it, it technically ended for a little while in 117 AD, but then the Jews got all upset again, and it finally culminated in the Bar Kokhba Rebellion in 132 AD, and that's, Hadrian was still ruling at that time. He had not, he wasn't ruling at the start of the Quito's War, but at the end of the Quito's War he would be appointed by Trajan. So Hadrian was still in power, and so he's bracketing to Hadrian's period of power and the cause of the Quito's War and he's lumping it together with Bar Kokhba. Now Paul does exactly the same thing in his meter in Ephesians 1, but I don't have time to show it to you now. You can go see it yourself in the Paul Meter GGS 11 channel. Because Paul maps it out in what we would call AD years. So 1 is 1 AD, so then all you have to do is go to 132 for Bar Kokhba. 114 for Quito's. Okay, it's real easy the way Paul did it. And why Paul did it that way, I explain in other places. It has to do with the difference in the calendar that was happening in the year Christ was born between a guy, an ancient woman named Livy, versus another ancient woman named Varro. Varro had a four-year error in his calendar, which is why we have our four-year error. 
and it was Varro's calendar that got adopted. So they had to keep making adjustments because even in their day, when they're accounting for Christ's birth, they had they were by law required to use by the time Luke is writing, they were required by law to use Varro's calendar. So that would they had to basically adjust like we do, saying that Christ was born late four BC. Okay. So they start their own Anno Domini, and that's kind of what Luke is doing here. He's playing on so that you could calculate it using the right Livy calendar or the wrong Varro calendar and still get the right date. Paul is doing the same thing. Okay, the point is, is that they're both, he's tying exactly to the next line in Matthew, which shows from the meter and the text that he's matching it. All right, same thing with Mark. Only what do we have that's new about Mark? Mark is, okay, let's go back to Luke for a minute. And they were saying, talking to him about the, the beauty of the stones of the temple. That's how it opens, okay? And how, it, how the beautiful gifts with which it was adorned. They were, you know, praising it. So what wasn't said in Matthew and that's how Luke does all of his Gospels. He wraps. Whatever Matthew doesn't cover, Luke will cover. So see, all you got here in Matthew was that they were pointing out the temple, not what they said. So now Luke Im adds to it by talking about how, what they said. All right? And then you have the same answer by Christ, but it's worded a little differently. Okay? Don't you, you see all, you know, yeah, you're, you're looking at all this stuff, but there's going to come a day when not one stone isn't going to be left on another. Okay? Now, why did Luke rephrase it? Why did Luke paraphrase Christ instead of say the exact words? Well, first of all, you're not 100% sure that's what happened. He might have said both things. So it might be a quote two times. Secondly, if he did paraphrase it, it's because that particular paraphrase would have more meaning to the people who got his gospel than the original phrase itself. You were expected to know, see, because you, you, you were expected to memorize it, because otherwise how would you know the syllable counts? And obviously he's playing to the syllable counts, so he's expecting that you had memorized it, and then he changes the words. So he's not introducing a, a contradiction or, or a different gospel. It's called indirect quote. We do it all the time. You know, oh, President Trump said that w women are, are pigs. Okay, well, Trump didn't actually say women are pigs. He didn't use it. He didn't say it that way. He said Rosie O'Donnell was a pig, if I recall correctly. But everybody knows what you're talking about, where in Trump's speech that was, so you could go look it up, which was the first debate. That's the kind of thing going on here. It's a paraphrase, or it's another direct quote, because he said it more than once. All right? But he's getting to the 63, and he's very definitely, a tr you know, marking it and mapping it to that line in Matthew. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, so what do we have? Our first phrase in Matthew, believe it when I tell you, and then in Luke, he's... he's adding the fact that they were praising the stones, which Matthew didn't say. And then he says, there's not going to be left one of these stones on another. Which is what the Matthew text says, but with more words in it, so he can get to his same 63. Okay, now we get to Mark, and Mark is writing when the troops are already around Jerusalem, just as Luke had predicted they would be. And now his 63 is saying, See all these buildings? Oh, but that's what Luke had said. You, you see all this? All this that you're seeing in these days. Okay, so Mark is picking up. This is how you know Mark is the third gospel. Another way to know. He's drawing attention to what Luke added. Okay? I mean... You could say, well, okay, well, he's also playing on Matthew, because see all this? Don't you see all this, is what this text says. Don't you see all this? 
Okay. Mark leaves out the word don't. And that's there's a real good reason why he leaves it out. Because you are seeing all this. You are seeing all these big buildings. You're seeing the troops around the temple at the time he writes. So he's not going to need ooh. Okay? He's not going to need that. You are seeing it. See all these buildings? Alright, so see how he's using the same word, oikodomas, as up here in Matthew? Okay? And just like Matthew used blepite to mark the death of Vespasian and the start of our boy um, Titus, so also the word, the use of blepo in Mark is timed. Okay? Titus would die in 81. Okay? But when in 81? What fiscal year is Mark using when he talks? He could be using a different fiscal year, so that will be considered officially 82 by that fiscal year versus the fiscal year that marks Titus's death. Okay? So that's what we have to find out. No, oh, I didn't. Okay, verse 2. I have to fix. I don't have the mark references the way I need to. Um, yeah, I have to fix the linkage so that you can go back and forth more easily. Okay? So he's saying, he's saying, wait a minute. Here we go. He's saying, you see. See, this is blepete. This is a command. Blepete is a command to see. Blepe is, is like, you know, see. It's not really a command. He's not using it as a command because he wants to get his syllable count to 63. And this is only two syllables versus three syllables up here. So you can see he's mapping to Matthew. Right? All right. And he's using the exact same word that is in Matthew. But at the same time, Okay, all these great buildings. Well, that was what they were talking about in Luke. Okay, you don't have the phrase all these great buildings in Matthew. What you have is them praising the great stones of the temple and all the great gifts with which it is adorned. Okay. So this way, he's, he's tagging Luke and Matthew. Plus, he's tagging the death of... See, this is really important. He's tagging the death of Titus. This was tagging the death of Titus's father, Vespasian. So, he's using the same verb as used in Matthew, also to tag a death the way that verb is used. This is what's called an anaphora. If you saw my Quantum Bible uh, episode 10, I started to take you through what anaphora do. They are benchmarking history. Okay. And they're very clever and they're very sarcastic. And here the word to see is used. Because when you're dead, you're not seeing anything. And everybody's seeing you be dead. So it's very sarcastic against the ruler who's being depicted as dead. Here, up here in Matthew, it was Ty it was uh, Vespasian. Here in Mark, it's Titus. Okay? Now, mind you, Mark is writing in 69. Alright? Vespasian has just come to the throne. So did Mark know that this was gonna be you know, did Mark know that this was gonna be the death of Vespasian? And then the death of Titus, his son, because they were both known as historical persons in those days. Did he know that? I don't know. But God sure did. And you see how it's matched? Okay? And the same thing with this. Uh, this, this particular Amen Lego Humin. Alright? This is in only one manuscript of Mark 13. It's in the Codex Biza. It's in the Bodleian Library. And... I maintain that it really belongs where it is in scripture. And in Bible works they have a, fa a photostat of it. 
and it, in the photostat it sits on its own line all by itself I've shown you that in prior videos okay so did they know how to parse the text like I'm doing it and that's like a piece of evidence that they knew to parse the text off because this is the end of a clause alright did they know to do that maybe yes that's what I'm, I'm you know waiting to find out I'm going to need more evidence than that. It's just a hypothesis at this point. But you see, it's not hypothetical to say that he was matching the syllable counts. All right? It's clearly not hypothetical to say that, that this text is intended to match this text, since it's talking about the same thing, just after Amen Lego Homing. But notice, in Mark, that takes you to syllable 91. Okay, that 91 is 91 years after Herod started rebuilding the temple in Mark because he's writing in 69 AD. That's how you know you count back 91 from that. All right, well, oh, wow, here we got the 49, it's referencing the same event. Oh, okay. All right. So then we got an obvious intent by each of the writers to tie back to Matthew, to tie back to the text, but they're referencing different points in time to show you that history repeats itself. Because remember, this is also going forward in time. This is 63 years from when Mark writes. This is also 91 years from when Mark writes. And what's true here in the past will be true again. Of course, the temple stays down. That's the first truth you get out of it. All right, you see how this is working? Now, as I showed you before, in, in the difference here in Revelation is that the temple's already down. So how does he tie back, okay, to Matthew up here, to Luke, and to Mark, they're all using the same 63. So he subtracts 7 because 63 would take you to the millennium, forward in time. And 7 years short of that should have been when the tribulation started. So he's writing you at, at the end of the first year when the tribulation should have started. But it didn't. So now you know why he's writing the letter. You see? And in addition to that, 56 years after he writes, is going to be Bar Kokhba, which is still about the same, the same theme. Temple being down. Okay? 56 years later, they're going to fight over the fact that the temple is down. But now he's going to talk about what's, in, what's up instead of the temple. At this point, that's when what's the, the whore gets put above Jerusalem. This is prophetic for the time when Aeolia Capitolina will be started as a result of knocking them out of the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Uh, Hadrian, who didn't yet exist at the time this is, this is written, will end up becoming the Roman Emperor will end up raising the whole of Jerusalem and rebuilding Aeolia Capitolina, that's the new name he gives it, and then the pig temple goes on top of where the Holy of Holies is. So he is still tying to Matthew because that's the purpose of the text prior is to warn about that same event and Paul had did, uh, done it too in Ephesians 1. So now he's talking about not the tear down, but the whore that gets set up as a result. And that, of course, is the whole chapter's theme. See, these tags, these meters, always tie to the chapter theme. They always tell you what the theme is. Again, so you know how to read the prophecy. Now, I'm afraid that I might have gone too far in telling you numbers, so just try to think over what was said. Use 1 John 1 9, talk to God about it. Because the scholars do not know what this is, and I sort of have to lay it out from scratch. Peace out.